morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is that you are tuning in. This is Unapologetically Me featuring me. No special guest, just me. So how are you guys doing? How have you been? It's been a little bit, huh? <laughs> well, I have just been moving forward, tackling one thing at a time here at home. To be completely honest, it has been really hard. <laughs> I've had a very difficult last six months or so, but you know, there's a quote that comes to me every time I'm feeling like I'm losing myself to the negativity within my mind. There was a contestant on America's Got Talent, and I don't know if any of you guys watched that show, or um, I know that there's a UK version as well, but on America's Got Talent some time ago, there was a contestant her name was jane but she went by nightbird and if you watch america's got talent i'm sure you know who i'm talking about you can't wait until life isn't hard anymore to decide to be happy here stood a 30 year old woman fighting for her life and yet those words still came out of her mouth those words were so powerful to me especially because they were coming from her. Okay, I'm done with the sappiness now. <laughs> On to the main topic. So I've also been listening to some other perspectives about the Nicola Bully case, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna talk about Paul. We're also gonna talk about Emma. And I know you guys have been waiting for me to get to this point, so wait no longer. I just wanna go over some things first. In my last few videos, I talked about how I've never really thought that Paul or Emma physically did anything to Nicola, but I've also mentioned that I believe that they know what happened to her, and that's my opinion. I looked into some financials, and while at first they didn't look like anything to take a life over, you know, take the life of the mother of your children over, I'm starting to lean more towards maybe that is the case. I looked into a few things a little bit deeper to see if I can make that theory make sense. And in this video, I'm going to tell you what I found. Again, most of this is just speculation because that's really all we have to go on. The facts are sparse. I do believe that it's made to look a certain way, like it's to protect the integrity of the investigation. But I personally stick to my main theory that the police are covering up something. And because of this, I can all but predict what the results of this inquest on June 26th will be. I want to go into some more detail about a video that I previously put out as part of a series. This was a three-part series going back over what had gone on in the initial investigation of Nicola's disappearance up until her body was found. In that series, I came to a conclusion in a way. I see multiple signs of a cover-up by the Lancashire Police Department and specifically by SAO Rebecca Smith. I pointed a lot of these things out, but I wanted to go back over some of these things in this video and I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about and let you decide for yourself what you think. Again, who is involved in Nicholas' disappearance and subsequent death or who is responsible? I don't know. I do believe it has to do with some type of corruption, money, organized crime, something like that. Because why else would the police be so keen on a cover-up? So let's go through some of what Rebecca Smith said again. And I'm going to be providing commentary on these statements. And this is going to be from the press conference that occurred February 15th which was actually held the day before the police force referred themselves to IOPC about the January 10th visit to Nicola Bully's house. I speak a lot about performances or a show that's being put on. And I even pointed out that when the divers were back at the weir, that in my opinion, this was yet another show, making it appear that they're doing their due diligence in their investigation. The fact is that in any missing persons case, the first 48 to 72 hours are the most crucial, yet the public was not formally notified until after that first 72 hours when Sally Riley made the first press conference appealing for dash cam footage. At the risk of sounding both redundant and confused, <laughs> let's just start with where I left off in part two of the series. Right away, Rebecca Smith began putting attention onto Paul Onsell, talking about how he's the reason that Nicholas' status was confused considered high risk. We all know about the Channel 5 interview that Paul gave two weeks into the investigation where he was 100% certain that Nicola was not in the river. 
So Rebecca Smith is saying that, quote, based on a number of specific vulnerabilities that we were made aware of by her partner, Paul, Nicola was graded as high risk, unquote. As soon as she was reported missing, following the information that was provided to the police by her partner, Paul, and based on a number of specific vulnerabilities that we were made aware of, Nicola was graded as high risk. Yet, Paul never believed that she was in the river. That evidently made no difference to how Rebecca Smith handled the investigation once she became a part of it. She was immediately treated as a MISPA. And then on the, on the Monday, the 30th of January, I was identified as the, as the senior investigating officer. At that time, we reviewed all the information that had been gathered in the days prior to her being reported. And as any senior investigating officer does, you form a number of hypotheses. That is scenarios which are possible from the information to hand. Those hypotheses included the one that she possibly could have gone into the river, that there could have been third party involvement, and lastly, that she could have left the area voluntarily. And why did Rebecca Smith, someone who works specifically with organized crime, be given this case? Uh, currently, I have responsibility for the force serious crime team responsible for serious and organised crime and also the online child abuse investigation team. Uh, the serious crime team um, oversees the force response to the investigation of serious organised crime. So this is a covert department um, of highly specialised officers with a variety of different specialisms. Um, for example, digital media investigators, we have analysts and we have um, a huge team of officers, a huge team, but a team of officers uh, that are surveillance trained. So on a day-to-day -day basis, they deal with a variety of different offences, but are absolutely the high end of serious crime across the force. And that might be um, around the importation of Class A drugs, or it could be the importation of firearms, county lines um, activity, the exploitation of children, or human trafficking. That is a question I have had ever since the beginning. Nothing about these vulnerabilities were brought up at the beginning, even though they were known from the beginning. And Becky Smith appeared to want to make it known that Nicola Bully had a reputation. She went on to say this, quote, at the initial stages, based on the information I received, I made it clear that it was my working hypothesis at that time, based with all the facts, that the main hypothesis I was working on at that time was that Nicola had gone in the river. This has been misconstrued in the press and said that was what I said. Does that make any sense to you? Does it make any Okay, I'm going to go on. I said that was my main working hypothesis at that time, and that remains my working hypothesis, unquote. I made it clear that it was my working hypothesis at that time, based with all the facts, that the main hypothesis I was working on at that time was that Nicola had gone in the river. This has been misconstrued in the press and said that that was what I said. I said that was my main working hypothesis at that time, and that remains my main working hypothesis. Now, when exactly was Becky Smith put on as the senior investigating officer for Nicola Bully's disappearance? And then on the, on the Monday, the 30th of January, I was identified as the, as the senior investigating officer. Day four, right? So when she says initial stages, she's referring to the fourth day into Nicola Bully's disappearance when she became the senior investigating officer. In my opinion, this little word salad was her way to get out of saying the truth, which is that she was put in charge to take the lead role in a cover-up. This was too big for Sally Riley, and Sally Riley had already been fumbling her lines anyway. Becky Smith then goes on to say, quote, at the minute, with the information that we have received and reviewed, there is not a single piece of information or evidence to suggest that there is any third party involvement in this investigation. And that continues and will continue to do so until we have reviewed all the information received, unquote. Again, it's another, another word salad. At the minute, with the information that we have received and reviewed, there is not a single piece of information or evidence to suggest that there is any third party involvement in this investigation. 
and that continues and will continue to do so until we have reviewed all the information received. Because if you listen to the press conference, it sounds like she's making a lot of sense. But as I quote this back to you, it sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, right? Like this is her talking. When I'm repeating this, it sounds like uh, just garbage. And again, I'll point out, the police never performed any sort of meaningful search of the area on the day Nicola disappeared, other than the river, of course. No crime scene, no cordon. They allowed the public to carry on walking all around the area, contaminating everything. There's not much CCTV coverage of the location and no evidence was gathered. So in my opinion, to completely deny third party involvement points to deception, right? We know that Nicola was allegedly listening to a works call and that her phone was found on the bench. But we've also been told that she was last seen up near Rowan Water, yet we don't have any evidence of anything. So how can third party involvement be ruled out completely so early on into an investigation? And again, I don't want to sound redundant. I've already put out a video playing these specific parts of Rebecca's speech on February 15th. So I'm just going to reiterate that there are no CCTV images and no real confirmed sightings of Nicola Bully entering these fields. And how and when Nicola left the field is speculation by everybody involved, including the police. The timeline changed a week into the investigation and any original eyewitnesses who claimed to see and interact with Nicola all of a sudden vanished just like she did. Why? I've asked several times for someone, anyone, tell me, show me one witness statement and one single CCTV image of Nicola that really quote unquote pins down her location at any point during her walk that morning. Becky Smith talks about issues and inconsistencies that have been raised in relation to Willow and her harness. She said that it was really normal for Willow not to have her harness on, that they never kept the harness on when they were in the field. Yet every photo that Nicola had taken of Willow on these walks that you can find, Willow is wearing her harness. And this was something that was brought to me by a subscriber. They sent me an email about this. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> Let me check this out. And it's true, there, there are a couple, but a majority of the photos, Willow is wearing her harness. So the phone, I believe is a decoy, and I believe the harness to be a decoy as well. The witness that allegedly knew Nicola was said to have spoken with her. And I'm gonna spare his last name, but his first name is Keith. And he himself has never once stated publicly that he saw Nicola. His wife, Hillary, spoke with the Times after they sought her out and she said her script and when anyone called to question her on it she hung up on them she had nothing to say doesn't make sense to me why wouldn't you tell the same story over and over if it were true the timestamps of 9 10 and 9 15 a.m i do believe are the times where the police believe something occurred not the last time she was seen because she wasn't seen in my opinion I believe the probe for dash cam footage on Garstang Road at that time is because they believe something happened at the Rowan Water area at that time. And that leads out to Garstang Road. It does not lead out to where the towpath leads out, which would be considered Blackpool Lane. They specifically asked for Garstang Road. And then they backtracked when people questioned, why not Blackpool Lane, where the towpath leads out? And they said, Blackpool Lane is Garstang Road. And technically it is because Garstang Road turns into Blackpool Lane as you get closer into town. But the locals would have known it as Blackpool Lane. Garstang Road would have been the area farther up near Rowan Water and beyond. And it would have been a totally different group of people depending on what time of the morning it was. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, but... <laughs> I'm trying. Another thing that's been noticed in the photos of Nicola when she's on these walks is that she's wearing white earbuds, which is more likely what she was using to hear that team's meeting with that morning. Why has there been no mention of these earbuds? This is another question from someone who emailed me and I questioned it as well. When you're listening to a team's meeting while out on a walk, typically you'll have your earbuds in, right? When Becky Smith speaks about the phone being recovered. She says, quote, 
The woman who found the phone makes a number of phone calls to people because at that point she doesn't know who the dog belongs to or who the phone belongs to and she doesn't know how to get in touch with people. She makes a number of inquiries with the local vet who can't assist her and following a number of inquiries, eventually people returned to the bench, recover the handset and Willow and we find out that obviously they belong to Nicola, unquote. She, make, she then returns and makes a number of phone calls to people because at that point she doesn't know who the dog belongs to or who the phone belongs to and doesn't know how to get in touch with people. She makes a number of inquiries with a local vet who uh, can't assist her and following um, a number of inquiries, uh, eventually people return to the bench, recover the handset and Willow and we find out that obviously they belong to Nicola. Again, what kind of jumbled word salad is this? <laughs> I feel like I have to point out again, listening to Rebecca Smith speak in these press conferences, it makes sense for some reason because she's very articulate and she's very, you know, to the point. But when I'm repeating the exact same words verbatim, it sounds like a bunch of garbage. Does it not? Does any of what I just said make sense to you? It sounds like a bunch of BS to me. We know the people who found the items on the bench were Penny and Ron. Why can't Penny and Ron get their story to match what Rebecca Smith is telling people? This is not the first missing persons case I've studied. I've studied many and I have never, ever, ever seen witnesses not be allowed to speak to the public and tell the public what they found, what they know, what time they found it. It's just absurd to me, the secrecy that is going on here. And it would be one thing if it actually made any sense to keep things quiet, but it doesn't. And any information that's been given to police has been basically like, no, we don't, we don't need that. We, that has nothing to do with this investigation. We don't need it. Yet at the same time, come forward if you know something. Like, what is this? They want to know what everyone knows, but they don't want to tell the public what they know. You know? <laughs> oh, God. Like I said, ugh, I don't want to sound like I'm confusing. This case is confusing, though. There's just no other way about it. Becky Smith then goes on to say, quote, So moving on to Nicholas' phone, I've talked to you about the discrepancies that have been flagged up with the team's call, whether she would have had that out in front of her whether she would have had it in her pocket. And we can say with confidence that Nicola that morning, whilst logged into her team's call, had the phone out in front of her listening to that call, unquote. How? How can you say that with confidence when not one person that allegedly saw her mentioned her holding her phone out in front of her? Now, Rebecca Smith will say that there is a witness who said, or witnesses, actually, plural, who said that they witnessed her holding this phone out in front of her, but I've never seen that printed anywhere. No one's ever come out and publicly said that. And we have two people that saw her, that knew her, allegedly, yet they refused to come forward and actually admit this in person. Neither one of these witnesses was ever quoted talking about seeing Nicola walking with her phone out in front of her or holding her phone in front of her. So how is Rebecca Smith so confident that that is how she was speaking on this team's call? In my opinion, it's a story. It's a narrative and they're following a script and everybody has this script. Unfortunately, certain people were not okay with following the script or weren't able to follow the script because they probably have integrity. And therefore, that gag order was placed. And anybody who tells me that there's not a gag order, there is. No one just completely goes silent. Becky Smith does go on to admit that, of course, they've done an exhaustive amount of work with Nicholas' phone and that they have digital media experts doing everything they can with it and that it has enabled them to help her with movements in the field corroborated by the witness accounts. Well, 
That may be the only truth that's come out of Becky Smith's mouth. Because you know when you're telling a story, you do tend to mix a little bit of the truth in with the lie to make it a little bit more palatable, <laughs> make it a little bit more believable. But we still, again, have no real witness accounts and the phone location data is concealed from the public. Becky Smith says, quote, there is no evidence whatsoever or information and there's been a vast amount reviewed. I can assure you in the last almost three weeks to suggest any third party involvement of Nicola leaving that field, unquote. Well, DSI Smith, I unapologetically disagree. I believe that due to the fact that she was in the middle of a Teams call when she vanished into thin air, and there are many photos of Willow always in her harness, which to me show that there's no reason Willow wouldn't have been wearing her harness when found, that the only conclusion I can come to is that they're decoys, both the phone and the harness, and that third party involvement is probably the only thing that we can be certain of. But because there is zero physical evidence, they can say whatever they want, and no one's gonna question it. And even if they do, just as there's no evidence to suggest an accident, there's also no evidence to suggest third party involvement in the physical form. I believe anyone who has critically thought about whether or not these statements made by Sally Riley or Rebecca Smith make any sense would come to the conclusion that either they are lying or they're covering something up. To me, that is very clear, which again leads me to the recovery of her body, which we talked about in part three of the series and how I believe it to be a complete staged discovery, which occurred just four days after this press conference was held. I know you guys now only have more questions yet again, and so do I. From 50 miles away, Jason Rothwell was led straight to her body at the same time Curtis Media was in the area, and at the same time that main photographer was in the area, both not living within 40 to 50 miles of the location. Even Jason Rothwell changed his story about how he found the body. First, he said it was floating to that final location, and later on he said that wasn't the case. If there is a cover-up going on, why? What happened to Nicola and why can't we know? Does Paul know? Does Emma know? I do want to say this, the location of where the body was found is smack dab in the middle of where Nicola was last seen and Marsh Farm Hall. And that's a fact. Now, I want to get into some other things that I've come across that are completely speculative, yet I have questions about, and this is where we're going to get into Paul and Emma. I'm really curious to know what you guys think about these things. Have you heard about them? Has anything been confirmed or debunked? Like I said, I've been dealing with a lot of stuff at home, so I I'm confident I've missed things. <laughs> I'm not even going to sit here and say, maybe I missed some things. No, I'm sure I've missed things. So wherever you guys can fill in the gaps, feel free. I would rather it be confirmed, but it's okay. Like whatever you guys have heard or whatever you want to say about this is okay. So the first thing I want to ask is what's up with this footage from Curtis Media? I came across this on TikTok the other day and I'm always very wary of TikTok, but there are a lot of real true crime creators that are very serious. They do take it very seriously. So it's just kind of weeding through it with a grain of salt. What's happening here? What allegedly is happening here is that Curtis Media went to this area and when he first went to the area, he noticed that it appeared that the ground had been previously dug up. He said it was really soft when he walked on it. And I want to say there are people who have thought that Curtis has staged this whole entire thing. But like I said, it's speculation. It's something that was brought up and it's something that I find a bit disturbing. So I thought I'd bring it to you guys. Okay. So he thought this felt like the ground had been recently dug up. It was softer than the rest of the area within the woods here. And then he went back later and the ground was all dug back up again, or it was dug up. And when he was there, there were two other individuals there. One stayed hidden from the camera the entire time. And the other one actually talked to Curtis, asked him if he was a YouTuber and proceeded to continue to dig there in front of Curtis while he was filming. So it, it was suspicious. Now, what some people have been saying is that this man that was pictured looks a lot like this man here kissing Paul. 
like they were friends. So I don't know what to think about that. What do you guys think about that? Now let's talk about Paul because there have been rumors flying around that he had issues with gambling, cheating. He was obsessed with money. And these are rumors that are actually based on what, what we've seen about him when it comes to money. Now, I don't know about the gambling or the cheating, but there have been rumors about these things in connection to Paul. And while I can't look at his bank records and I don't know how much money he was making from his job in the US, we do know he was in debt. And typically, if you're making decent money, you're able to pay off those debts at some point without your business being shut down, right? Now, I am well aware it takes money to make money. I'm well aware. So oftentimes when you own a business or you're starting up a business, anyone who owns their own business would know this. You're going to have debts. That's not abnormal. So that's why at first I was like, okay, they have a little bit of debt, but it ended up being at the end of the day, about 4,500 pounds of debt, which to me wasn't enough to take someone's life over. Right. But it does show irresponsibility in finances because this debt had gone on over the course of a couple of years. Then I showed you how after Nikki's death, the dissolution of the company was suspended. Paul used to work for a company called BAE Systems. This company has a pension scheme and there are a lot of benefits to this pension scheme. But one of them is that when a loved one dies, you're paid out benefits. Now, I don't know if Paul was a part of this pension scheme or not, but you don't have to currently be working for the company to still hold a share in this. So he could have been working there, was a part of this program. When he stopped working there, you can still hold like, I, I said hold a share. I don't know what it would be called, but you can still, it doesn't mean that you're not part of it anymore. So just because he wasn't working there doesn't mean he still wasn't part of this. Paul was also the benefactor on all of the businesses. And I've already shown you, as I said already in this video and another video too, that the business that was underwater has now miraculously made somewhat of a recovery. Now it doesn't show a full recovery, but shutting it down has been suspended. So he's been given time. This pension scheme was called the Royal Ordinance Pension Scheme. And the first thing that it says is the scheme gives you a final salary pension when you retire and provides death benefits for your dependents. And then of course we have life insurance. Now I tried to see if I could find a life insurance policy. Some of it is public record, but I would have had to do all sorts of things and pay money and whatever. And I don't know if anyone else has for a fact gotten any life insurance information for you know, for a fact, I can only guess though that at 45 with two kids with businesses that they own that there was a life insurance policy. And if there were, it would only make sense that Paul were the beneficiary because of the children, right? And Nicola was probably the beneficiary for Paul. So we have three main profit areas to consider as motive. Now, we've been told that Nicola had just made a mortgage deal that was worth a decent amount of money, and she was really excited about it. And now this is just my opinion, but I do believe that she was really excited about it because this was the deal that she needed to make that would allow her to leave Paul. I do not believe that Paul is the man he wants everyone to believe that he is. I believe that like many other characters within this story, Paul's putting on an act. And I'm starting to believe this more and more. He's very charming, he's smart, he's calm, cool, collected, and he comes across as very caring. But in my opinion, he was very different behind closed doors. There have been comments made on social media from people who are close to Nicola that certainly do make it seem like Nicola and Paul were having issues. The CCTV footage from that morning that Nicola went missing, allegedly, I know some people don't believe that to be the case, that that is Nicola, but I do believe that that is Nicola. And I do believe that Nicola did take her children to school that morning. It's what happened after she dropped them off is where, that's where I start questioning things. But in that CCTV footage, there's no interaction between Nicola and Paul. And while some people have said, well, it's the morning, or maybe that's just how they were, that's great. But it's like, they didn't even look at each other. Had Nicola told Paul that she was leaving him? I believe she did. And that's my opinion. 
Nicola was finally at a place where not only was she done dealing with certain things, but she was financially stable enough that she could leave Paul. In my opinion, this is what I think. She was going to leave. She was going to expose him in court for who he actually is. Paul liked living the high life, but he couldn't afford it on his own. He liked the finer things, but he couldn't have them without Nicola. And I don't believe that Nicola was an alcoholic. I've always said, I believe that like any other 45 year old woman, she was having some issues with things. But I also think that at 45, she had had enough of some things as well. In nine years and two children, Paul never committed to her, as in married her. Paul has allegedly had some issues with gambling, as I said, he was in debt, and he may or may not have been having affairs. Typically, those things do go hand in hand. They don't have to, but a lot of times they do. And to be completely honest with you, if that was the case, at 45 years old, I'd be out of there too. I believe Nicola worked her ass off to get to a position financially that she could take the kids and she could leave Paul. But I don't think she was going to be the one to physically leave. I believe she was going to keep the house, keep the kids, and she was going to kick Paul to the curb. Paul said he was in a panic that morning, but the panic wasn't that morning. That panic began the second Nicola told him that she was done putting up with his shit and she wanted him to leave. She was not going to continue to work her ass off for money to pay off his debts from his problems. Meanwhile, he's out running around with whoever behind her back. I said Paul's a charmer. He charmed Emma, he charmed Louise, and he even charmed Nicola's mom and dad. But you don't see Nicola's parents standing behind Paul, now do you? I wonder why that is. It's been said that Louise moved in with Paul directly following Nicola's disappearance. And to anyone else, this would probably appear, as it appeared to me at the beginning, it was that it's to help out with the girls. Obviously, Paul's now responsible for two little girls and Louise moved in to help with them and rather to displace them, put them with Louise. They just figured, you know, Auntie Louise is going to move in for a little bit and, and help out until mommy comes home. And I can understand that. And it may be that. But some people have found it suspicious from the beginning, especially when Louise and Paul were pretty much parroting each other when speaking during interviews. Something that everyone noticed to be suspicious is that no one shed any tears when talking about Nicola publicly, including Emma, who seemed to get choked up quite a few times, but her eyes never even reddened, let alone watered, and tears never fell. Now let's talk about Emma. You're just walking your dog, doing, doing your job, and then you disappear. Could this be that she really wasn't as close with Nicola anymore? Or could it be that this disappearance was expected and maybe not necessarily a sad moment for Emma? It doesn't necessarily mean that Emma and Paul were having an affair, but it also doesn't mean that Emma didn't have love for Paul. Like I said, I suspect he was quite the charmer. Was Emma in love with Paul? I know you haven't seen Paul, we've just seen Paul drive past. Yeah, he just came past his car then. Um, put, him, put yourself in Paul's shoes, he's got this underlying worry going on, sadness, heartache. But for those two little girls, he has to be so strong. We've heard a lot from uh, Paul tonight, uh, Nicky's partner. and He's told us a lot about the Nicola that he loves. What about the Nicola that you know so well? Yeah, I think just from seeing her face out there, she's, she's touched the nation, hasn't she? And everything that you see and a little bit more is what she is inside. She's beautiful, she's caring, she's thoughtful, she's kind, she's funny, she's loving, the most loyal friend. She's the stuff that dreams are made of and we've laughed, we've cried, everyone in between. And then you take Nick, Nikki's lovely, amazing qualities, you add Paul's in there, and then we've got these two little human beings that we have to do everything to bring Nikki home and, and bring their mummy home for them. And the strength that it's given me to then be able to be, I heard in Paul's interview, that pillar of support. Mm. With people supporting me, we've been able to support Paul and the girls, and I cannot thank everybody enough. And we need to bring Paul and Gert and the girls there rock home mm. to bring Nikki home. Well, Emma, I know you do an incredible job, and it's very much appreciated by Paul and, and many others there uh, in the village. Thank you for your time tonight. Do take care of yourself. As I said today, I'm almost feeling a little bit numb today. Um, two weeks on, but we still have that hope that today will bring something and we can bring those girls home to, to Paul and yeah. Yeah, Nick, bring yeah. Nicky home. He can't crumble as well when mummy's missing. Paul's got to remain very strong for them. 
but he's taking each day as it comes. Obviously, we keep in normality the children at school. So Paul has that downtime to sadly think and reflect on what's going on. Right, okay. Are you happy with the police investigation where it's going? And to comment on the efforts that the police and like Peter are doing. I mean, it, it was no, obviously Peter cemented the work that the police have done and can confirm that she's not in the river from, from the bench to the weir. Right. Just need a different line of inquiry to give them something that they can go on and, and, and bring Nikki home. Would she help Paul out if he were in trouble? There was a post from 2021 where Nicola posted that she was in a relationship and Emma responded saying, does Paul know? Hope he's a keeper. And she even tagged Paul in that question so that he would be able to see it too. Nicola responds by saying, after 10 years, he's stuck with me now. And Emma again replies with, does Paul know? Now, what the heck is that supposed to mean? That is a really awkward way to respond to your best friend <laughs> saying that she's in a relationship with the father of her children as if it's weird. And does Paul know? Hope he's a keeper. What about Paul? You know, it, it, these are the types of posts that make me think he may not have been as loyal as he would like people to think. One thing I do feel pretty confident in saying is that Paul was in love with money. And the reason that I say I feel confident in that is because every single social profile that Paul has, the only thing he speaks about is money. It's making money. It's being an entrepreneur and having your own business and profiting from that. There's nothing about him being in a relationship, nothing about his children. And now I haven't been able to see his Facebook. That may have been where he shared all of that. A lot of these social profiles are meant for business, right? But at the same time, I mean, he was following Bill Gates and some very prominent entrepreneurs that are multimillionaires. He wanted to make money. He wanted money. He wanted to live this high life and he wanted to be respected as someone who made a good amount of money. When it comes to Emma, if she were involved, I believe love would have been the motive. Not love for Nicola, obviously. Love for Paul. But Paul would have just used Emma as a pawn. And this is just my opinion. But if the two of them were involved, what I believe happened, and this is again my opinion, this is entirely speculation. Everyone I speak of in all of my videos are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. In this case, I don't think anyone's going to be, but the motive for Paul would have been money. And he may have used Emma knowing that Emma was in love with him, whether or not they were ever in a relationship together. I believe he used Louise. I believe he had everyone conned. This is like one of those sociopaths, these con men. And I believe that he may have hired someone to do this for him. Or it is possible that as Eddie's Vinyl Break has been talking about, that this setup happened between Paul and Emma. And when Nicola was in that field, she was called away. I think Eddie's theory on that may be accurate. The only other theory that I have is that it was a hired hit and Paul hired someone to do this. And she was surprised in that field by someone else who lured her and, you know, the rest is history. Now, I don't know if if she was supposed to be taken out uh, and, and that happened later. Maybe Paul owed money to loan sharks because of his gambling issues and because of his financial troubles. And, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time a man started gambling to pay off a debt and ended up in more debt to the point where they needed to go to some bigger people up there and this is where organized crime plays a part if 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 this were the case and then he borrowed that money he didn't get it back in time they took nicola as ransom they asked paul hey where's the money paul wasn't able to get it nicola was taken out 
So, and that would be where Rebecca Smith is coming into play. If there were a ransom note involved, did someone get a hold of them later on and say, hey, we have her, she's still alive, we're holding her, pay this money by this date, or she's done. Because four days into the investigation, remember, Rebecca Smith, organized crime leader, came in to take over. So that's where my head's at now. <laughs> Always, my mind can change. Everybody's can New evidence comes out, you start researching another thing, another angle. I have always stuck with organized crime as being a part of this, and that has never changed. I still do believe that either someone was hired to do a hit, or this has to do with money and Paul. So, like I've always said, I don't believe Paul took her life, but I do believe Paul may be the reason her life was taken, and Emma is possibly a pawn within all of this because she probably knows exactly what's going on and she is trying to help Paul in whatever way he needs because I do feel it's possible that she's got a little crush on Paul if not more that's my conclusion that's the end of this video I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing next there are a lot of other cases I want to do updates on that I have done in the past that have had some significant updates that I wanted to talk about. So we'll see what my next video is. Thank you guys so much for listening and coming back, subscribing, liking, commenting, sharing. I enjoy all of it. And uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend and week. And I will talk to you guys on the next one. Bye-bye.